the sun and everything was revolving around me. It was so exhausting. (laughs) Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 40, Like Children, with Mary Harbin. I'm Mark Cain. If you're new here, this podcast is unique. I'm helping connect Unitarian Christians around the world. Who are these people, and why? First, Unitarian Christians are not the same as Unitarian Universalists. We are quite serious about the teachings found in Scripture. Serious enough we may speak up and risk rejection. We feel a unique kinship with our Messiah, Jesus the Son of God. Jesus and us, we have the same God, and that God is one. How do we live in relation to our God? Well, we look at Jesus and how he lived in relation to his God. Trinitarians would agree with following Jesus, yes. But for us, that life that Jesus lived, it wasn't put on. He wasn't omniscient, choosing to not be omniscient so that we could learn how to navigate life as one who isn't exactly omniscient, even though he is. Trinitarians can say he was fully human, entirely human, 100% human, but then they have to add, and he was God. For us simple people, it's like having a nice piano and then shoving it out of a tall apartment building. (laughs) It's rather shocking to say the least. The theory of the Trinity presents an absolutely mind-bending picture of our Lord, how he lived, what he knew, when he knew it, what he didn't know, and how he could, with a straight face, tell us he didn't know it when he actually did. The New Testament writers didn't struggle with this. They're like the people who are walking down the street when the piano hits. And they don't even turn their heads. The New Testament writers didn't turn their heads. They didn't startle over the realization that God died. They didn't ruminate over the perplexing hypostatic union. Even after he was resurrected and glorified, they could write about the man Jesus and not be nervous about shortchanging his ontological majesty. We Unitarian Christians believe a more reasonable and likely theory for what we see in the New Testament is that Jesus was a human, a rather amazing one, and now glorified, but a human. And we believe that God, that's Yahweh, He was the one Jesus prayed to and obeyed. Sure, there are a handful of verses which are hard, but we think the explicit and simple verses should govern the interpretation of the difficult passages, like John 1 and Philippians 2. So, what verses aren't as difficult? Well, the ones like this that Jesus was a servant of God, that he was humble, that he received the words that he spoke from God, that he did not have authority in and of himself, that of himself he could do nothing, that Jesus has a God, and that Jesus told us that the one true God was the Father. And that's just to mention a few. The references for those verses are in the show notes. We are quite convinced that if you asked any child, how many characters are there in this story, and who are they? The answer would be, God and his son. And that child would say it with a confidence and sincerity that rivals the bravado of modern theologians, those who can write volumes of speculation on Trinity theory, only to barely move the needle of understanding a nanometer. To a very large swath of Christianity, rejection of the Trinity is tantamount to a denial of the faith. I humbly submit that they are wrong. The Trinity is a theory, and it has some serious problems, but 
It's a traditional part of historical Christianity. It's been propped up by generations of wonderful, loving people and some awful people who were willing to kill non-Trinitarians and destroy their life's work. But never mind them. But if you just read Scripture like a child, guess what part of the hypostatic union you would miss? (laughs) All of it. Guess how many natures you would count when you read about the life of Jesus? None. You wouldn't even know to ask about natures. The Trinity is like processed food. You can't pronounce the ingredients. You have no idea what they really are, and often you don't even want to look. Yet you smile and enjoy the taste and and enjoy how easy it is to pop it in the microwave and then give it to the kids. But there is something better without all the strange ingredients and without GMOs. Uh, That's um, gilded magisterial opinions. That's what Unitarian Christianity is. It's sincere people wanting truth more than they want tradition. So why are we doing this? Well, because being one of those people often doesn't go well. We end up isolated and cut off from others. This is why we are doing this. This podcast is helping to connect us together so that together we can withstand the pressures that want to see us silenced. Mary Harbin's experience may not be like yours. She and her husband had the unique opportunity to read the Bible with little to no preconceptions and without obligations to tradition. If you're like me and grew up in a church, You never really had a moment when you said, hmm, what's in this Bible? It was a part of your weekly life. But for Mary, it was an exciting new discovery. And a discovery in the nick of time. I got to meet you at the UCA conference just a few weeks ago. It was great. It was. It was really neat to see all of the people I've watched on YouTube or listened to on podcasts <laughs> yeah. in person, and they're really humble, actually. But, you know, you're like, oh, it's kind of a superstar celebrity type deal, but it, they weren't at all like that. <laughs> yeah. So I got to meet you and your husband, Seneca. Yes. I wish we'd had more time to chat, but, you know. You got to work the room. I mean, it was but, pretty packed crowd. Yeah. And the thing that I liked was John Lynn once told us we were eating breakfast in like a Cracker Barrel, and he said that we are the only ones in the room that know the truth Hmm. out of the whole restaurant. And it was, um, it was nice to be on the other end of that, where everyone in the room had the same idea about the cornerstone. (laughs) Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, John Lynn recently died. He was the he was one of the founders of um, Spirit and Truth, I think. Then he, I think, split, and then he has uh, the Living Truth Fellowship. Yeah. Tell me about, like, the early days before you had come to faith. Yeah. When I was young, my mom was a, um, well, I guess both my parents were, um, they were Seventh-day Adventists. And so we went to church on Saturday. And, okay. you know, I have really fond memories, but the church ended up burning my mom. Mm. And that happens a lot, I think, with a lot of people. Yeah. And so we left the church, but she always remained faithful, which was great because sometimes people lose their faith after they get burned by their church. Yeah. So I didn't go to church unless it was with a friend or something. I got invited, but it was very seldom. That was pretty much my whole life. Fast forward and was married. My husband was in the military. Okay. He did five tours. He did four in Iraq and one in Kuwait. And by the end of it, it was just, he was not the same person he was when we were first married. Hmm. How soon after you got married did your husband end up on tours? Well, he was on one before we got married. Oh. When he got back, we actually got married and moved down to Texas. And he left pretty much right away after that. So it was just like a few months after he had already gotten back from Iraq, he returned to Iraq. Oh, man. So just for those who don't know how long tours last, a typical tour would be how long and then how long back home and then... Well, normally it's not like that, but Fort Hood was a rapid deployment. So, like, you could get sent back to back to back. The first tour, I think, was a little bit over a year, maybe like 16 months or something like that. Wait, it was 16 months long? Yeah. Because some guys, you know, is like 18 months oh. when the war first kicked off. 
And it was tough for a lot of soldiers and their families. Yeah. So the very first one after you gotten married, how long was that one? Like, because, I mean, that's like the prime time of being together. It was probably, um, probably like 12 or 14 months. Oh, my gosh. That was probably a rough tier for him. I think his second and third ones were really, really rough. He was in Ramadi and Fallujah, some bad areas. Hmm. Every time he came back, it felt like he left more of himself over in Iraq. Hmm. Until basically he was just like a shell of a person. He was emotionally unattached. He was, he was drinking a lot. He was never abusive or cruel to me, but it, he just wasn't there. I always tell him it was almost easier when he was gone because at least there was a reason he was not there. Oh. It was harder when he was in the room and he was still not there. Mm. Living with someone like that, you know, especially your husband who you're supposed to have this loving relationship with. Yeah. It was so hard and it put me in like a really dark place. It felt isolated. I felt very alone. And especially after his last tour, he left like about a month after our daughter was born, four or five weeks. And he didn't come back until she was maybe 14 or 15 months old. Mm. He got like a one week break, but um, I mean, that's not really that much time <laughs> to see your daughter. It was, it was a hard time in my life. Mm. And Faith wasn't a part of your life at this point. Oh, no. I, I had no idea. I was not praying. I mean, the only time I would pray was when things would get really bad, and then you're like, oh, God, help me. But yeah. I had no connection to God whatsoever at all. Mm. And neither did Seneca either. Yeah. And I think that's probably what made it so hard, though, honestly. Looking back on it, if I had God in my life, I would have had more peace. Yeah. How many years was the, his time in the military? He was in for seven years, and I think he was on tour for a total of probably about four and a half years out of the seven years. And that's one of the reasons I pretty much made him get out, because when he got back home, he was supposed to ship out to Alaska, and he was going to have to actually go to Afghanistan hmm. right away. So hmm. he would have been home for like a month and then had to go to Afghanistan. I'm like, I can't do that anymore. You're going to have to get out. Luckily... His enlistment was pretty much up, so he was able to do that. He would have come back. You would have moved your entire family to Alaska, had a completely new world for you, and poof, he would have been gone. And so the one person that you knew in Alaska would have been back in Afghanistan. Oh, yeah. Oh. I just couldn't do it anymore. At what point are you going to run out of luck, I guess? Yeah. He came home pretty unscathed. Like, mm. emotionally, no, but... You know, he wasn't missing a limb. He didn't yeah. die over there. And I don't know, at what point would you go over there and you're just risking more and more? Well, that's true. Yeah. Statistically, if you keep going back, every time is another chance of getting hurt. And actually, someone that we knew ended up dying over there yeah. in that same tumor. So, yeah. So you said no. Yeah. <laughs> and he had served long enough, I guess. Yeah. Once you put in an amount of time, then you can either re enlist or you can. She's to depart, I guess. Okay. Well, that had to be nice then to finally have him back. Well, when he got back, he went into the oil field. So he was gone um, most of the time. He'd be home about five to seven days a month. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so wait. It wasn't, it wasn't really any better. He, he was safer, but it, he was still gone. Okay. So you lived in Texas still. Mm -hmm. When you say go into the oil field, like he would literally be out there? Yeah, down south in Texas, he would be doing the fracking. Okay. Almost near Mexico. It was probably like a four to five hour drive from where we were. So they had a little dormitories that you could stay in down there. Yeah. So you say, we can't handle this anymore. Come back home. And he gets a job and he's not home. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> like I said, our our relationship was getting worse. I don't know how much longer I could last with him. He was hard to be around. He was toxic. He was angry all the time. Mm. Emotionally, he wasn't supportive. So I just felt like I was a single mom almost, doing everything by myself. So how did you get through that part, the oil fields? I don't know. I don't know how I got through it. I mean, I know God had something to do with it, looking back on it. But 
I was a nervous wreck. My anxiety was getting so bad where I was struggling to leave the house. Really? Honestly, like I had such bad anxiety. I was so self-absorbed in my own life, in my own little bubble where I was, I'd stay up late worrying, just stuck in these thought loops where I'd rehash things over and over and over again mm-hmm. because I was putting myself in the center of the universe, so to speak. The sun and everything was revolving around me and it was exhausting. It was so exhausting. (laughs) Sounds like it. You're doing everything in your own strength and you're trying to be in control of everything. You can't do that. Right. It's not possible. And it's going to make you a nervous wreck. Yeah. How, I mean, being a mother is already hard. Being a mother as a nervous wreck. (laughs) I mean, how, how did you get, I mean, could your kids tell? Did they know? Oh, I mean, I'm sure they did. When one person in your family is going through any kind of mental health, struggling in any way, and you're living with that person, everyone feels it in the family. Just like everyone felt when Seneca was home, we all felt, you know, he was there, but he wasn't there. Mm-hmm. And when he showed emotion, it was usually just he's mad about something. It was just this toxic energy that he had. Okay. You know, like I said, he never was abusive or cruel. You know, I probably count on my hands the amount of times he's ever raised his voice ever, and they weren't at me. (laughs) So (laughs) he's a soft talker, very soft spoken. Yeah, he is. He is. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you could just tell he was mad about stuff all the time. He's just mad. Yeah. And that's no way to live your life in anger and bitterness. And no, of course, the kids don't understand why. How do you explain that to young children? How old were your kids about this point when he was back in the States then? My youngest daughter was probably a year old. And so Lily was three and a half or so by the time he got out of the oil field. And it kind of dried up and it was just a good time to move on to something else, I guess. And he went into construction. Okay. So he was still gone all the time. Like, you know, people in construction work long hours generally. Right. So he'd be working 10 to 14 hour days, six days a week. But in those cases, he actually lived at your house finally. Yeah. So he was home every night. So, okay. <laughs> so, so. That, that was a little bit better. Yeah. To have a little bit of support at home. Someone yeah. there with you. Yeah. Yeah. But you were both still struggling at that point from what I hear you saying. He hadn't come out of this funk that had happened to him while he was in the military. Oh, No. Not at all. I mean, he had severe PTSD, I would say. Mm. It was, um, it, it's not something that most people, most soldiers, when they get out, they don't usually talk about anyways. Because they think of it as like a weakness, but a lot of them experience it mm. like a, in silence, I guess. And their family also is going through the same thing with them. And most of their families don't talk about it because if you were to talk to me, you would never know I was struggling. Hmm. I just wasn't someone who, I guess, talked about my feelings either. You kept them all inside where they were happy. and you know. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah. So apparently the answer to the question, does keeping all your feelings inside make things better? No. <laughs> no. I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. We eventually moved... Because I was like, I wanted to be around my family again. I was, I thought things would get better, you know, changing the surroundings. I thought that would, yeah. that'd be good. But, you know, I realized that the problem was really within me. Is I didn't have any connection to God. There was nothing bigger than myself. It was like I was in the church of me, basically, praising <laughs> me. <laughs> and that place is a mess. So I, <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't go there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 in the past episodes, I've talked about the way we deal with the truth in our hearts. Like we know something is wrong, but the answer to the problem is one of brokenness before God. You know, the reason that something feels wrong in us is because something really is wrong. And the church of me is not a functional church. You were trying to be something happier, something better, but it like, it's also a nasty loop because it never fixes. The heart doesn't just, oh, okay, you, you feel good about yourself. Now life is better. It's just feelings and they don't, they don't stick. But. Oh, absolutely. And it didn't matter where I was. It didn't matter 
how much money we were having. And none of that changed the way I felt inside. Hmm. It didn't change until I found God. Well, let's talk about that. So you move back to Indiana. It doesn't fix the real problems. But how does the transition take place? Well, I think, like what you said earlier, I would, I knew inside myself that there was something there was something that I was missing. I didn't know what it was. And I, mm. I felt compelled to go to church. I wanted my kids, I didn't want them to have a church of me. You know, I wanted them to have something bigger than themselves. Mm. Because that's how I made my life was just always about myself and no one mm. else. And I didn't want them to do that because I was not happy. And I wanted my kids to not live like me. <laughs> I wanted them to have something better than myself. So okay. Seneca was very against going to church. Hmm. But he agreed because because I was going to go with the kids anyways. Hmm. He's like, well, if our kids are going to be there, I'd like to know what they're being taught. I'm like, fair enough. <laughs> well, good <laughs> yeah. for him. T- yeah. <laughs> we live in the Midwest, so you basically throw a rock and hit a church. <laughs> we went to one right down the street. It happened to be a rather large church, probably 1,000, 2,000. Oh, wow. I guess to give you some idea of it, it had like a cafe inside, like auditorium seating. Wait. It had the big projector screens. It had the fog machine. It was wow, it was one of those big church, like a mega church type. You're talking like that isn't normal for all the churches. <laughs> I have been to really small churches. I, I prefer a smaller church if I'm going to go well, to a church. <laughs> like, yeah, our cafe is one pot of coffee that sits in the little kitchen. <laughs> We actually did have a fog machine once uh, last winter. The heat went out in our little building at our church, and we didn't know it because we were all off for COVID for a few weeks. Finally, we got back to the church. The sanctuary was 35 degrees, and I I have a picture of our pastor talking with the fog rolling out of his mouth (laughs) because it was so cold. He's just saying, that's the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So, wow, a big church. Okay, so— Honestly, it was really great. Like, I had all these preconceived notions about what Christians were going to be like, Mm -hmm. that they were going to be judgmental, and I was going to not fit in, and they were going to ask me a bunch of personal questions I wasn't ready to answer. (laughs) Yeah. But it was was really great. Everyone was just amazing there. Okay. The first time we went and we, like, tried to sneak in, that didn't really work because— they recognized that we were new, so everyone was welcoming us. All right. But we sat in the very back, <laughs> and uh, we made it through the first one, fine, unscathed. <laughs> so we decided to go back, and we just kept going back. Okay. At some point then, something started to click. We were going, and we were listening to the sermons, and it was basically like we were so ignorant. We didn't know any of the traditions. We didn't know anything. Mm. So we thought, like, maybe we ought to— read the Bible a little bit. I had never read a Bible in my life. And that's when it started clicking. Not at first, though, because I kind of drug my feet. My kids got some adventure Bible from the church, and that's the one that I started reading in. That's the one that like has pictures on some of the pages and then the extra paragraphs to explain things, right? It- yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great, honestly, it's a great Bible. Yeah. And I honestly like all the little vocab words that they had and the explanations. I enjoyed it. (laughs) Well, that makes sense. If you don't know anything, you're no different than a 12-year-old, really. I mean, you open like Sabbath and you flip over to something. Like these are words that you don't (laughs) normally. Like a Farsi. A Pharisee. Pharisee, yeah. Yeah. So I still don't know it. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, you know, you, you see these definitions there and they explain it for you. So that would be a reasonable Bible to use. At first, I honestly was just reading it, so I I wasn't going to put my foot in my mouth or something, you know. So I'd be a little bit knowledgeable if someone was talking to me about it. So the first time I read it, I did think it was very beautiful. But a lot of it, I was just like, mm-hmm. I don't know what, what any of this stuff means. So, Interesting. And I only read the Gospels. Okay. I didn't read anything outside of that. And then um, it probably took me a month or so before I read it again. And meanwhile, Seneca, he, you know, he was more like a light switch when he, he started. So you and he both started reading the Bible together, mm-hmm. but it impacted him. I'm interested in that. What happened? 
Well, I guess I have to give you a little backstory. Okay. My mom would always tell me that you have to believe in Jesus. Wouldn't it be like Jesus' nature or who he was? Nothing like that. But you just have to believe in Jesus. Okay. So I did hold on to that. And I remember talking to Seneca, and he he was raised not anything. His dad was not religious, and his mom is a self-described pagan, like a pagan witch. Oh. So he had no no preconceived notion at all mm, no. about anything. <laughs> and I remember talking to him about Jesus, and he was saying, well, I don't believe in any prophets or Messiah. And first, I, you know, I'd never heard of that term Messiah, really. Okay. So I was like, okay, well, you, you believe in Jesus, though? And he's like, no. And I was like, well, you, you can't not believe in Jesus. And he's like, well, why not? I can, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> right. And this, this is during the period of time where you are actually going to the church. So this is like yeah. the conversations are coming up and you're having these talks yes. about this. And we're honestly reading the Bible at the time, but he still was, no, I don't believe in it. Okay. And after that, he was waking up at 4.16 every day for like weeks. And he didn't tell me about it at first, but he told me about it because one day I woke up and he's like, oh, it's 4.16. I'm like, okay. But every single day, weekends, everything. Mm -hmm. And he just had the mind one day to be like, you know, I wonder if this is a Bible verse. So the first one he turned to, because, you know, there's a lot of chapter four, verse 16s. There are. The first one he turned to was Proverbs. And it was honestly about sleep. I actually have it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um. For they cannot sleep unless they do evil, and they are robbed of sleep unless they make someone stumble. To me, it was like a little bit more than a coincidence that it happened to be about sleep. Mm. And then, you know? <laughs> yeah. And um, he said later, God spoke to him and said that you cannot know me unless you accept my son. And after that, I believe it was the next day, he got baptized and he never turned back. And that was like the light switch. Wow. Like his anger went away. He was more present. He did this complete 180. And like, I think six months later, he was running a ministry that he founded for <laughs> veterans. <laughs> yeah. So that didn't happen for you. So you watched that happen to your husband. Yeah, I saw that. And that. That really gave me, you know, the curiosity to say, if that happened in his life, I want that to happen in my life. And so that's when I really started reading the Bible. And I actually started praying and not just, you know, when I'm having a bad day, but it was like, you know, God, give me knowledge. Let me know you. I want to know you. And he did do that in my life. The more I was reading scripture, and I think honestly, just the more that I was praying, that anxiety and that loneliness and depression, it just was gradually just going away. Mm. Until like now I just, it's almost not even praying anymore. Like I have just this open dialogue with God where I'm just talking to him all day. Yeah. And it just has given me such peace. So for you, it was a, it was a slow transition. Mm, yeah. How long ago was Seneca's switch and your the real beginning of your process to change? I mean, honestly, it's probably only been two and a half years. It hasn't been a long, a long time. Oh, that's amazing. Okay. The second time that I read the Bible, and that is when I like read it with an open heart. My prey was just for God to let me know Him. Yeah. That was when I read a verse. A man said, good teacher to Jesus. And Jesus instantly said, why do you call me good? Hmm. Only the Father is good. For whatever reason that hit me, and I was like, wait, what? Because I had some kind of knowledge about the Trinity, not a lot. Yeah. But I knew that there was like a three in one. You were attending a church where that was one of their doctrines. So you were exposed to this idea, right? I mean, not really. <laughs> they don't really talk about the Trinity in church. Was it from your childhood then? Like some residual memories of what you were supposed to believe from when you were, your parents were in church? I feel, I feel like it. I feel like I remember hearing, you know, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Okay. I remember that, but I don't, 
my mom never said that, and okay. our church never really talked about that at all. Because well, some people, like, they're hearing it every week at church. You know, it's like it's in their face. And then they have a struggle where they're, like, in conflict with a pastor. You know, they're disagreeing at Sunday school. In your case, you just remember this idea. Right. I mean, in church, I, I don't think they ever— they never, ever cover the Trinity. We even took a class. It was like the first steps class where you would go and they tell you some of their beliefs, you know, mm-hmm. but they never told you about the Trinity. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Okay. I mean, I feel like that would be the main focal point. Mm-hmm. It should be, at least if that's what you believe. And that would be the first thing that you'd explain to someone. A lot of times, like they'd have a sermon about anything and then they would just throw in a Jesus is God out of nowhere. Okay. That would basically be the Trinity for them. Okay. I just wanted to figure out where that had come from. Because here you are reading this first now. Let's pick that up there. So I think it was probably at night. The kids were already asleep. Seneca was getting ready to go to bed. I think he's probably actually in bed. (laughs) And (laughs) I walked in and I was like, hey, I've got this really deep theological question for you. (laughs) And he was like, okay, what? I asked him, like, who is Jesus? Like, what is he? And he said, he's the son of God. He's the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. I'm like, where do they get the Jesus is God? And he's like, well, I don't believe Jesus is God. I was like, you don't? (laughs) And to me, that just gave me the freedom to be like, oh, well, I don't have to believe that either. (laughs) I won't be the only person that doesn't believe it. (laughs) Right. Was it just because... I mean, I guess he became a Christian at a church that wasn't teaching the Trinity. He read through the Bible, and he just came to the conclusion naturally that what you see here in the Bible is this this man, Jesus. He's the Messiah, and he just went with it. Well, I think, like I said, he didn't have a strong Christian background. And I think if you gave anyone a Bible and said, read this, I don't ever think that they would come to the conclusion of the Trinity, ever. Hmm. Just different you know, different natures or however, different people, however they want to, whatever spin they have on it. I don't, I don't think he would ever come to that conclusion. So I think just for him personally, I think if, since he didn't have any kind of preconceived notion and he went in completely ignorant, I like to say that we went in like children, Yeah, you know, I was reading that Bible as proof. (laughs) (laughs) So Seneca answers the question and it's just a simple, honest way, then what happens for you? Oh, well, it it gave me way more curiosity to be like, let me see if I can find the Trinity in here at first, you know? Yeah. And I couldn't. And so I just kept reading and reading. And for a while, I thought that we were the only ones that believed that. Yeah. We would try to look it up online, but I didn't have the term biblical Unitarian. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, and without that, like all you would get would be Jehovah's Witness or Mormon, and we weren't that. So I'm like, right. What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I did the wrong thing, I think. <laughs> what was that? Oh well, I just felt like I was holding this powerful knowledge that everyone should know too. Oh. So I would just be talking to my family members, like, "Hey, Jesus isn't God. Just read your Bible. He's not God. <laughs> if you read the Gospels." He'll tell you that he's not God. He'll tell you that he's the son of God. And that was pretty offensive to even people that weren't really in my family that aren't really Christian. Hmm. It's pretty offensive to even them. Like they were like, you're a crazy person. (laughs) It reminds me of when John Lawson talked about giving it some time before you you start opening your mouth. It looks like you went went right in. (laughs) Couldn't help myself. No, now I'm more... I don't think I would lead with that if I was trying to convince someone. Okay. So the connection with your current church then stopped. Yeah, I think it was during an Easter service, and I want to say that it was the one last year. The pastor said God died on the cross. When he said that, I was like, I can't keep coming here because that's not right. God is immortal. He cannot die. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was so different from what I believed. I I could no longer go there. Okay. We tried out a bunch of other churches, but it all was, it's all kind of the same. Yeah. You know, you can tolerate it a little bit, but it it gets hard because you can't say anything. You can't really speak your faith. Mm -hmm. We did once, we told a Baptist pastor and it was a small church. We were out to dinner with him and we told him that we didn't believe in the Trinity. 
And we like gently told him, not just come right out. Jesus isn't God. Yeah. I think that was a Friday night. And we went, we went to the service on Sunday. In his sermon, he made it about oh. there's either people that believe Jesus is God, and then there's everyone else. Oh. And so I was like, well, I guess we're in the everyone else category. Oh, no. <laughs> and then I was like, well, now we can't go here yeah. anymore. <laughs> like, is this a theme or something? Like, Because that was exactly Amanda's situation. Mm-hmm. Remember, she had a conversation, it got passed around, and then boom, the next Sunday, the sermon was basically at her. Yeah. I wonder how often this happens. Ugh. You know, honestly, in a smaller personal church, I could definitely see that happening to people. Yeah. Basically shaming you. So you didn't have any luck finding fellowship. So what have you guys done then? Well, I was reading a book. I think it was Don't Blame God. And while I was reading it, I was just looking at the cover and the back. And um, I saw that, oh, well, this, I think it was Spirit and Truth Ministries. Mm-hmm. Um, that They're based out of Indiana. And it's a couple towns next to us. And then we saw one of the authors of that book, John Lynn. He was... My husband like creeped on him on Facebook or something, but found his email address. And he, Mm -hmm. he actually responded like a half hour later and we were kind of blown away by that. But he's like, let's go get dinner sometime. Mm. And we agreed. And so he was the first Unitarian we ever met, knowingly met. Maybe there was more that we just didn't know about it, but he was the first one that was outspoken about it. So we would have like fellowship, like meals together every so often. And we did find there's a lot of fragments of the way around us, I think, because they're based out of the Midwest. So, mm-hmm. right, they're good people. It's just we have a little bit different beliefs. So you didn't mesh well, I guess. Right. Okay. Even to this day, then, you don't have a local get-together. No, we don't. I wish we did because I do miss our church. I do miss the, um, I miss, I guess, the things that you could do with your kids, too. Mm. They had a lot more fellowship opportunities with adults, too, but especially children. They had a lot of activities. I'd like my kids to be able to grow up in a church, but I don't think that's going to be a reality for us. Hmm. Well, we'll have to get busy then at the UCA. (laughs) I hope so. Because what if there's like a dozen people in your area that just haven't cropped up yet? You know, it doesn't take a lot of people to get together and have group experiences of faith. Well, I did notice that the UCA, the little member directory, Mm -hmm. it does have a whole lot more people than it did when we originally had signed up. So maybe it's gaining momentum and we check it every so often to see maybe there's going to be someone, you know, in our town or a town next to us that we, that's willing to meet with us. And maybe they, they're our age group and they have kids too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting to know that just one spot showing up on the map could actually represent more than one person. Like in the early days of the UCA, I put myself on there. And so if somebody had just found me and got to talking to me, they'd realize, oh, it's not just Mark. Mark's the only one on the map. There's an actual group of people that get together every week. And that's amazing. You know, there are churches and groups out there. I I think about like um, Chuck Graham. I think it was episode 23. Here he is in this church out in the country, and then we find out there's like 60-some people in this church, and you know, you just have to know that they're there, and that's the crazy thing. It's like, I know there are more, but just hidden, just out of sight. Yeah, and I think, I think there's a reason for that. They're maybe afraid because they've been through the same experience as most hmm. biblical Unitarians. They've had a lot of fallouts. And so maybe that's why they don't broadcast like, oh, hey, we're a biblical Unitarian church, because then maybe people would shun them or pick it. You never know. Yeah. Or maybe they just think they're also some of the only people out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, here's hoping that in the next year, more things pop up and we can fill in those gaps in Indiana and everywhere else. It means so much to have people that you can just be with and pray with and laugh with. And the kids have their little lessons together and they come out with their little cutouts and their crayon drawings. And like, I just love it. Oh, yeah. And I, after we went to the UCA conference, just realizing all these people had the same problem with fellowship. There were people that had spouses that were Trinitarian still. Mm. 
So I'm really blessed at least that we can have a family unit on the same page. And yeah. Most people I talked to at that conference didn't have anyone near them, at least that they knew of, mm. that were also biblical Unitarians. Well, we're working on it. Uh, do you think it would be weird to say that we already have plans for me to stop by your house? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> No, I think it's good because I think it shows people that you can still maintain some sort of relationships, even if we're all spread out. And maybe there's a reason we're all spread out. Yeah. You know, you only need a little light to shine a huge, you know, a huge dark cave. Mm. And I would always encourage people to be outspoken in their faith, lead with a lot of grace, but also don't be afraid to tell people what you believe. Because the worst thing is they're going to shun you. If you're hiding who you really are and what you really believe, then, I mean, you're already being shunned in a way. That's a good point. Well, I'm looking forward to, uh, we're going to be traveling over the coming holidays to my in-laws, which takes us around the Indianapolis area. And I had looked and saw that you were close by. So I reached out to Seneca because we had met at the UCA conference. I felt comfortable just binging him and say, hey, I'm going to be in your area. Can we get together? And we now have plans. We're going to stop and have dinner at your place on the way to visit my family. And I'm completely excited about this. We're really, really excited about it, too. As long as you guys like pets and don't (laughs) mind some cats and some dogs, we should have a really good time. (laughs) I'd like to encourage people to just check the map. And look, you know, there are people that live near where my in-laws live. I'm going to reach out to them and say, I'll be in town for the week. Do you want to get together? I'm going to see how many people I can hit in this one trip just for coffee or tea or, you know, lunch. I don't know. But if you are spread out, what do you do? You find ways to get together, even if it's occasionally. Anyway, I'm excited that we get to come by and I get to see you guys again. The UCA conference was nice, but it was very short conversation between us. So we'll fix that this time. I really did love... um the encouragement segment and to hear everyone. And that's why your podcast is important because you get to hear everyone's story and we're not like some cultish, crazy loon people. We're, we're just average people. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for helping us get to know you and hearing your experience. Let's just hang in there. We'll enjoy the small connections we have across the planet for now. <laughs> and, and if Jesus returns and we all are like having a dinner and Jerusalem? Well, you, that'll be our get together. So, <laughs> good way to look at it. <laughs> Just, yeah, don't get discouraged because God loves you. Don't lose hope. If I may ask, how old are you and Seneca now? I mean, you still seem fairly young. We're 35. Okay. And your kids are then 10 and 7, almost 8. Oh. And we actually have one on the way. Wait, what? (laughs) I'm due in April, so. Oh, my goodness. I I didn't know that. (laughs) I'm way more looking forward to it. I haven't been stressed out about it. I think because I have God in my life that I'm like, I'm so prepared for it. Mm. You know, it's just a blessing. I don't want to say I have a do-over, but I'm going to enjoy this one so much more because I'm not going to be so worried and caught up in my own self, so. I'm really excited about it. And I think, honestly, Seneca's excited about it. And he doesn't even like babies. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he hasn't had enough time with little babies. I don't think he wants time with babies. Uh He's not a big baby fan. So (laughs) maybe this time around he will be. (laughs) This is his chance. This is the big moment for him. He missed it before. He had an excuse. Oh, I'm off to Iraq or wherever. But not this time. Oh, this time I'm going to make him do way more stuff, too. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) A reminder, if you saw Dale Tuggy's presentation on John 1 and some questions came up that you think may be of interest to us, let me know. We're going to try a question and answer right here on the podcast. And I've got room for a few more questions. Send me audio or write to podcast at unitarianchristianalliance.org. If you've not signed up yet so that people can find you or that you can find others, you can do that for free. Unitarianchristianalliance.org. 
Under the About menu, you can read the FAQ, the Frequently Asked Questions. Or you can get to the Help page. There's a friendly video on Becoming a Member. And there's also one on Creating a Group. There's also an option to be a supporting member, where you can contribute a little to help, or simply the option to donate. You may also know some people who would be thrilled to be a part of an effort like this. They may not know about the UCA. You, my friend, are all that stands between them and unfettered joy. All right, maybe not, but you probably know a few people, the kind of people I'm talking about. Let them know about this. If they aren't quite sure what to make of this whole thing, you can point them to the last episode, number 39, Reflections and Purpose, or the introductory episode, number one. Then, once they start listening, you can get together with them and bring your UCA podcast trading cards. Out now is a limited release, the Dan Weatherall and Paul Davenport Golden Collector Edition from Episode 16, Bible Feed Podcast. Collect all 40. (laughs) Now, perhaps you are thinking, I would have loved to have heard a bit from Seneca. Well, that's exactly what I was thinking. It just so happens that Seneca shared a few thoughts during the encouragement time at the 2021 UCA conference. My name is Seneca Harbin, and I was not born with a voice for radio. We're from Indianapolis, Indiana, and we run a group called Veteran Support Ministry. We try to bring former military back to a relationship with God. In the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verse 27 through 29, Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. That's very encouraging. But it still doesn't take away the pain or the sorrow or the remorse from losing relationships, losing friends, things like that. When you choose the truth, you walk away from a lot of things. You lose your position at churches. You lose all kinds of stuff, silly stuff, fleshly stuff, but it still hurts. So my words of encouragement, in comparison to eternal life, What would anything out there really matter? So I just want to encourage everyone, stay strong in your faith. Know the truth of God's word and his son, Jesus. God loves you. And if I can do anything for you, get with me. Thank you. Thank you, Seneca. And thank you, Mary. I look forward to our visit and for many more to come. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well. No pianos were harmed in the making of this podcast.